when I first started playing the game in the core and I came home and I just showed it as like a little dumb game, I never thought I'd be sitting here being interviewed about a movie being made about it. It all started in phase four of boot camp after the crucible. So we had a lot of downtime about two weeks before uh, families came and picked us up. Obviously we started playing games in the, in the squad bay. And uh, I walked in one day and there was just this group of dudes in like the corner behind some racks so the drill instructors couldn't see us. And I was like, what's going on over here? And they were just playing this game with this box with a bunch of rocks in it. And I was like, what is this? And they just asked me. How many rocks are in a box? I thought it was fantastic that Roy showed it to us and that Marines were just playing this at boot camp because they didn't have anything to do and it was a way to kill time. Everybody got so mad and the matter they got, the funnier it was. You can't be excited about that. That's the obvious answer. The fact that your ego dies, that's what really stuck with me when I played it and that's why I thought it was just a great movie concept. Because once people get it, that aha moment is so cool to see. Sure, there's five rocks in the box, but there's also three. And if you don't listen to the other side, you ain't gonna learn what's right and what's wrong. I said, man, if that tapped into me, I'm sure it's gonna tap into other people too. And I asked Roy to, if we could show it to people, I was like, yeah, just, you can't tell them the answer, and... When I first got the phone call from Nick about making a movie about some dumb field game that we play in the Marine Corps, I was like, how the hell is this guy gonna make a movie out of this? I always knew I wanted the movie to take place back in the day. Roy always said, pass it down to the other people, and then those friends are gonna pass it down to the next generation. I thought that would be something as a challenge to make the 60s world come back during a pandemic. I always went back to these kids, and I'm in my room and I'm thinking about, well, is there a kid's game or a toy that has rocks in it? And I think about it, I'm like, ah, the Rock'em Sock'em Robots. That was a game that came out um, in the, you know, back in the day. And sure enough, there's an advertisement from the 60s with these robots fighting in this ring. And then I look at it and I do a double take. And it's just like movie magic and you just get these chills. It's a box with two guys inside, and one's Republican, and one's a Democrat. And I just sat there, and I got emotional like I did now, and I cried. Because I knew it was going to be so good. So good. <laughs> Whenever, like, say, like, whenever you were young, what's run the scene, like, oh, there's somewhere I need to be, right? Like, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> The film is based on true stories. It is based off of Roy Coates, who came back for Rocks in a Box. It's based on politics. It's based on my life. You, you know this game, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. You know too, right? Yes. Okay, good. You know this game, right? Yeah, I know this game. You know too, right? The phone call that Nick and I had about the idea for the movie, I was just thrilled. He was like so excited, but like also so serious about not revealing too much. It felt like I was uh, being invited to the, to the Oscars. I was surprised. I said, yeah, sure. It was a very exciting phone call. I was still writing the script when I was calling people to be involved because I would work on projects in the past and they were, you know, they were good. Um, it was just that when I would show my folks, sometimes they'd be half interested. A few years ago, I was, I watched The Shining by Stanley Kubrick. I just thought to myself, I said, I could never make that. I could never make something like that. And then I, I look at the movie and I, and I said, oh my God, I got two girls, one riding the bike to Austin and coming back. I got a box, like the monolith. I even got the sergeant from Full Metal Jacket. And I just, I said, God, I did it. It's funny how you play rocks, paper, scissors during the film. <laughs> I thought, wow, this guy put a lot of time and meticulous effort into putting this film together. You could tell a lot of work was put into, especially the sets. Nick and I busted up pallets, nailed them all together. I a good three, four weeks straight. Yeah, busted our asses. And from there, we just, we just took off. My friend Seamus, he said, interesting how your film takes place in, in like the mid 60s. Everybody was wearing clothing that was half conservative and half out there. Yeah, because they're half liberal and half conservative. <laughs> I was like, all this red and blue stuff is so incredible. And I'm like, 
we are making history here because this is the first time we've seen a movie about colors from a colorblind director. Oh my god. We're on some next level. Definitely the type of script that has to be read more than once. Yeah. This was a new film for me because in the past I did comic book spin-offs and so this was the first film that was actually my vision all the way through. Whenever I wrote the script, I said the bike stuff is going to be the hardest stuff that we do and that we pull off. You know, how do we pull that off? And uh, I remember Alicia, the assistant director, telling me, we got to do the bike stuff first. I'm just like, oh man, this is going to be a challenge. I see a crew of people with the camera behind them for that one shot. I, I asked Nick if I could see it and I watch it. I'm like, this is... This is different. Nicholas is someone that really puts a lot of focus and detail into what he does. When stuff has to get done, stuff has to get done. And he conveys that very, very well. The detail, the small details. That level of intensity that he brings to his work. That's professional right there. That's, that's just a professional film. Like, I've never seen Nick come more alive, get more in tune with his work than the filming of the infamous rocks in a box scene. I always want to push myself with the 180 degree rule and to have a conversation with six people, which is actually the chaos number, by the way, and shooting them individually. I mean, we shot the movie with one camera. Filming the rocks in a box scene was quite challenging because we had a lot of people. It was dark, it was freezing, the fire kept going out, the wind was blowing it everywhere. It was no easy feat. I mean, we had to make sure that everybody was on board consistently. You have to consider people putting the lights, him giving direction, making sure everyone's quiet on set. We would go until one in the morning and everyone was exhausted and everyone just wanted to go home. It didn't feel like a school project. I can tell you that much. The muscle cars. That's when it really started to feel official, I think, because it's like if you're just shooting like a, a normal like student type film, like you don't have that, that luxury. You don't even have those resources. But when you're actually taking your film seriously, you will go that extra mile to reach out to people. The professionalism that we went into this with, you know, it was very much like we're going to do this. This is something um, that we're taking seriously. It's a, it's a nice pleasure just to sit and watch everybody in the way Nick, that, Nick operates his, his scene. He has a message that he wants to share to other people. And it's not just the glamour of making a film project or having all this equipment. No, that's not what it is when you're working with Nicholas. It's more of like, okay, we're going to work together as a group. We're going to collaborate, um, respect one another. And we were able to get the job done in a really professional way during a really big crisis. It's funny that you ask like, what my initial reaction was to getting my part because I wasn't even supposed to have a part <laughs> up until the, the film was about to be shot. After I had my initial call with Nick, we discussed where I would like to fit in. And I think what I told them was I would like to be a part of the behind the scenes crew filming the documentary because that was my forte. Like I love shooting interviews. On the crew, I was gonna be the drone operator as well because he had a couple of aerial shots in mind. Nick and I had a second call, it was sort of like an emergency call, and he told me that the actor who was gonna play the Corey character had dropped out and he needed somebody to fill in. And he told me, you know, it's really, you're the only one that I think could really pull the role off on such short notice. So I thought about it for a night and I was like, yeah, I can do it. So I said, yeah, sure. I learned a lot from having Roy on set, and I think that that was a huge benefit as far as taking our production value up a few levels. I wanted to make sure that not only did he look the part, but that he walked the part in the way that, that he stood and walked, maybe even talked a little bit, a little bit more confidence, because, you know, what more could you ask? Yes! If we didn't have Roy on set, we would have made a lot of mistakes. But when I threw the, the fit on together and I stepped outside and Roy saw it, he said, yeah, you pass. And coming from somebody who's actually a Marine, that actually meant a lot as far as like getting the, the look to be proper and to be what we needed it to be. So yeah, that was, that was pretty cool, teaching him how to walk. I love Steven. Seeing him in that in that like uh, that main role was was pretty awesome. You know, he uh, plays the role of the flustered person really well. I very much viewed Austin as a very frustrated individual when I first read the script. My initial interpretation of Austin 
wasn't as angry or as angsty as I ended up portraying him, but that's because of the brilliant direction of Nick. The best line of direction I ever gave to Steven was the shot where he has the packages. If I told him, act uncontrollable, then he's gonna think uncontrollable. It's like saying, don't think of white elephants. I said, you ever played The Floor is Lava? Recognizing that Nick could pull those things out of me by giving me a, a form of direction was fascinating. It was so cool. That got me into a better mindset. Act like I'm not drunk, but I am drunk and everyone around me thinks I'm drunk. Nick gave me the direction that we had just gotten out of a relationship. Little did I know that Nick's intention from that was pretend to be a racist without actually acting racist. I was later told my character is supposed to represent Rosie the Riveter. And she is saying, we can do it. We can defeat racism. And he's like, this is your time to like let it out. So I did. Eat your marshmallow and take a chill pill. You're a baby. No, use the baby. In that moment, you let go of Steven, or you let go of Mally or Colton or Zach. You let that go, and you became the character. I told them to all the actors, I said, yo, trust me, give me your 1,000%, and I will make you look good. He kept his promise. He said he was going to make us look good, and he really did that. They let go of their ego. This project um, reminded me why I love film, period. Just a quality time for us to get to spend with each other, kind of like a last hoorah of all of us, you know, being together as like a family. We had so many good times talking about just life and working with Nick and hanging with Roy and meeting Elena and Alicia and working with them on things and get, getting to meet Zach again and working with all the fantastic photographers. Nick trusted the right people to do the jobs he needed to be done. Being able to like help one of his dreams like come to life was really exciting for me. It's magic when something like that happens when everyone just like battens down and says, all right, this is what we're doing and we don't care how many takes it's gonna take. I've never seen more dedication from a group of kids in my life. I knew it was, it was bound to be successful because um, they go above and beyond. You don't find people like that. I was just happy and excited to play in the movie. A lot of fun. I had no idea where it was going to go, like some sticks and rocks. I, I had no idea. But here we are. It, it has touched a lot of people, one silly little game. But definitely now, like, saying goodbye to it, it it's hard when chapters end. I think the majority of people will say 2020 was the worst year of their life. But for, for me, it was the best year of my life because I made the best movie I could ever make with my the friends who I love. Um, it's, uh, it's great. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs>